Thank you, everyone, and thanks for making time out of lunch to talk about a really important topic. There's a series of great speakers you're going to hear from this afternoon, and then we're going to do some short Q&A. What I want to do in the five minutes that I have is to tell you three short stories. So my name is Aileen Gemma Smith. Yep, I'm an AWS community hero, and I want to talk to you first about a story where I was brought in at a high school to be an internship coordinator. And the reason why they asked me to come in as an internship coordinator was this was a career in tech ed high school. And they were having challenges creating internships for their students because employers said, not sure that's the folks that we want. I don't know about that. So the principal came to me and said, Aileen, can you help? Said, yes, absolutely. Because what I could do is then say, I'm a fellow business owner. I absolutely believe in hiring interns. And I want to talk to you about that opportunity. What about this school? Mm, I don't know about that. I said, really? That's interesting. Because both of my kids go to that school. Oh, well, wait a minute. That, that changes things. Well, help us understand. I said, well, listen, this is a career in tech at high school where students walk out with two degrees. Not only the high school diploma or certificate, but they also are experienced in learning different things, whether it's um, <laughs> architecture trades, whether they're doing software engineering, construction and more. And I want you to think about creating opportunities for those students. So that's story one. Part of what we can do in terms of building inclusion is thinking about how do we use our position of privilege or our position of power to do something different for someone different. Story number two. Again, I do a lot of work with high school and university students because if we want to change the ratio, if we want to change what's happening here in technology, we have to think about what's happening at the beginning. So we've got a great band of, batch of interns doing wonderful work. And they communicate back to me that it's a bit of a challenge because they've got to go and bring by hand their signed worksheets in in order to get paid. And I said, well, why are you making them waste their time this way? That's no good. I'm happy to deliver them in. And they said, no, no, we've got to teach them responsibility. I said, hold on a second. Do you know the background of the students that we're talking about for these internships? And they said, no. I said, well, I have three students that travel over an hour and a half each way, each day, in order to show up at my internship at my company. I absolutely respect the fact that these students take the time and the opportunity and they show up on time. Now, you're telling me on a day in which they should be helping out at home and doing other things, they now have to spend another hour and a half to come in just to deliver a piece of paper? What are we really teaching them about an expectation about privilege and about accessibility? Not good things. I'm going to wrap with one last story, and this is about my dad. Be the voice for others. You don't have them. Here in public sector, we have amazing opportunities to create solutions that serve everyone. But when we're designing and building those solutions, what happens when we don't think about that end user? So a lot of times when we're doing our user research, I put my hand up and say, hi, I'm going to be Joe Fadulo. He's 82 years old, and he has a flip phone. Talk to me about how these solutions are going to help Joe. Because Joe is a constituent. Joe wants to belong. Joe wants to be a part of that community. So as you think about building more diverse organizations, think about who you're including, who you're bringing into the conversation, and what we all can do together to do more. Thank you. The infrastructure for Central Australian Aboriginal Congress. Uh, we're based out of Alice Springs in the Northern Territory, so smack bang in the middle of the country. I've been pretty lucky in my career so far in that I have always worked for organizations comprised of really different and unique groups of people. Uh, in fact, it's been very rare, uh, only on a very few occasions, have I sat on uh, a board or worked with a team comprised of your stereotypical white male people. And I think IT is a great profession for that. IT is a global industry. It spans the world. It translates into all languages. And in many respects, as I'm sure many people here can attest to, a great technical outcome really mandates opinions and beliefs from a lot of uh, really different people and from different backgrounds and from different cultures. My first few jobs straight out of uni were working for organizations who uh, sourced talent globally. Uh, wherever the talent was, they, they, they went for it and they got it. So this meant that we were sometimes leading projects from people in 10 
15 different time zones around the world. Uh, so we had to learn how to get along with people from different cultures, different backgrounds, different technical affinities, especially people have religious wars over, obviously over their uh, technical, um, technical preferences and people who work different, way, different ways, collaborated different ways and, and that kind of thing. And if you couldn't merge those people together and get them to work as a team and be happy to come and work and collaborate as a team, you, you simply didn't get, you didn't get the results. So that, that was really good for me. Uh, you, you, made it, you made it work or, 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 you, or you didn't. Today, I find myself uh, working with uh, an Aboriginal community controlled health organization uh, or ARCHO. Um, Northern, uh, Central Australian Aboriginal Congress is the largest ARCHO in the Northern Territory. And our goal is pretty simple, but also pretty complex, and it's pretty awesome. What we do is uh, we work to provide especially culturally appropriate, um, holistic, comprehensive primary health care for uh, Aboriginal people living all throughout Central Australia. And for that reason, we employ uh, we employ uh, around half of our pretty significant workforce uh, Aboriginal people. We've also got quite a number of people who uh, have immigrated from outside of Australia and now work and live in Alice Springs with us. So it's fair to say that personally, I've, I've never really had too many dramas with diversity in the workplace. I've been lucky enough to just be inserted into workplaces where there is diversity by default. Uh, which is really good. So uh, just, for the next, uh, uh, just for the next couple of minutes, I just wanted to focus on, on that inclusion aspect. So even us internally uh, in our IT team, we have to be working with all different kinds of stakeholders to make sure that the services that we're providing externally and internally meet the needs of our clinicians and our practitioners and that the software that we're delivering will have a a better health outcome for our clients, which are Aboriginal people. When we don't reach out to stakeholders, and it's the same across all industries and all projects, when we don't reach out to stakeholders and actually have that op uh, opportunity to include everyone in the projects that we're delivering, you, you get a shitty experience. You, 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 you get a bad outcome. And so I just wanted to focus on the inclusion aspects of the in uh, diversity and inclusion um, theme here today in that how do we get uh, people involved and included where um, they might be underrepresented or, or not, um, not necessarily uh, vocal and wanting to put their hands up about uh, the work that, that's going on? When I was studying uh, business quite a few years ago, uh, I got a pretty good uh, grade on a, on a health, uh, oh, sorry, not on a health assignment, on a human resources assignment. And I got this by looking at uh, a theory by Dr. Marilyn Brewer called the optimal distinctiveness theory. And that sounds fairly complicated, but it really isn't. All optimal distinctiveness theory says is that to be included and to be part of a team, and uh, it sort of goes on to define what part of a team is. You have to have a sense of belongingness, which I think we, we all want. We all want to show up to work and, and be happy and feel like we belong to the organization and that the organization wants us and that we're doing something that's beneficial. But that that belongingness needs to be equally weighed up with a sense of uniqueness. So you don't want to be completely overtaken by a company's culture to the point where you're just going with the motions and you, 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 you cattle. Um, you, you don't want that. So if you're too much, um, just based on that theory, if you're too much of an individual, as much as uh, uh, human resources uh, managers don't particularly like that phrase because everyone's their own special snowflake these days, uh, if you're too much of, a, of an individual, um, you can, uh, you can, you're not working with the rest of your team. And I, I think that's a fact. If you're too much of an individual, you might be really valuable to the organization, um, but you're, you're not working necessarily with the rest of your team, uh, which means you're not getting the best out of your team, and you're certainly uh, not getting the best out of that resource. On the other hand, if uh, somebody in your team is too much of a belonger, I think we all know that person, someone who's a company cheerleader, everything needs to fit into these particular categories, everything needs to be done the company's way, you can really downplay that sense of uniqueness and dilute um, or, 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 or um, get, not get over that sort of dominant culture um, that the business is, is performing and that, ha that hampers innovation. Uh, I think uh, I've, I've mistimed this speech, <laughs> apologies, um, but 
my, my point is it's, it's, you really need to find uh, that, that balance between creating a really inviting culture where people want, uh, people want to work and people are happy to work uh, versus nurturing everyone's uniqueness. And that balance is, is really difficult to find. And I've, I've, got, uh, I've got a lot of ideas around how to do that uh, and a lot of ideas that have, that have uh, been implemented quite well. And I'm happy to, to have, a, have a few chats, uh, get a little bit more specific after, after the presentation. Thank you. So many of you here uh, today. I hope you've had a great day. So at um, Amazon, I have kind of three roles that I'm really proud of. So I've been at Amazon for two and a half years, um, and that's off the back of a long career in management consulting. Um, I really kind of fell into um, technology, to be honest. It wasn't a deliberate career path that I chose. Um, I did a Bachelor of Commerce and Marketing at uni, uh, close to a couple of, well, maybe nearly three decades ago. Um, and um, uh, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do with that. I thought maybe I wanted to do uh, you know, something in, in business, didn't want to do pure marketing. And, you know, it just so happened that the consulting companies were doing a bit of the, the uni career days and I kind of went, yeah, consulting life sounds good. I can do lots of different things, go and work at different corporations, experience lots of stuff. Turned out to be a pretty good move because what it did give me is a lot of experience across many different enterprises. I did a lot of um, ERP, massive SAP implementations. And what I learnt from that was the idea that really you had to have all of those components of people, process and technology to absolutely make a difference in terms of what was happening in an organisation. Throughout that time though, there are a couple of kind of defining people that helped me on my journey. So early on, um, one of my, my first tasks as a graduate going into consulting was actually developing training materials. And I learned the hard way, right, in terms of it has to be perfect. I had an awesome manager who was so um, really rigorous on what actually needed to be done and making sure that every single edit was taken into consideration. So what I learned from that was just attention to detail. And that's something that I've continued to really enhance over the years. The other role model that I've had throughout my time has been uh, someone that kind of really contributed to my keys to success. And I guess I would say it's really about um, saying, you've got this. So I think sometimes, you know, um, whether it's women or other kind of groups of people that are maybe not as confident as others, it's really kind of backing yourself. You've got this, you can do this. So having a bit of that can-do attitude to really take that forward. I guess fast forward to what I'm doing now. Um, so I talked about the fact that I've got three roles. So one of those, I'm Enterprise Business Development Lead for Australia and New Zealand, and that really helps me and my passion to help our customers innovate through their use of technology. My other two roles are equally, almost if not more important. So I'm president of our Women at Affinity Group. So our Affinity Groups is our way in which we allow our employees um, a voice in terms of what they want to see in the future organisation. So for Women At, we're really focused on ways in which we can um, have a better experience for our employees currently, but it's also about what actually happens in the community, how we're attracting more, um, particularly girls, so starting early stage into STEM careers, super important. If we're going to change the way in which we've got a gender imbalance in our pipeline, we have to start back um, inspiring and educating girls early on from primary school and upwards and then taking that right through in terms of how we're creating the right environment for our own employees, making sure that it's not just the job of one person, it's actually the job of many. So that really comes to that inclusion piece. And then um, the third role that I have is a really important role in how we hire people into our organisation. So again, one of the ways that we create a diverse and inclusive workshop, workforce in Amazon is through our leadership principles. And hiring and developing the best is one of our leadership principles. Do we have it all right? I would say no. We, we, we would still consider it's very much day one. But through the mechanisms that we're introducing around affinity groups, through our leadership principles, we also have a global initiative called We Power Tech which is really, again, our way of looking at ways in which we can help disadvantaged groups across the globe have a more equal and fair access to technology. So once again, thanks for taking the time. Think about what each and every one of us can do 
um, to really think about how we have a much more diverse and inclusive workforce and community. Thank you. All oh, good, excellent. Um, my name is Mary Ellen. Um, like my um, counterpart, I have had three particular roles, or I wear three particular hats at the moment. I'm the global technology lead for Geospatial for Jacobs. Um, I work with a community of practice of about a thousand super users across the world. Um, and that is like defining our next steps in technology and application, our market services, and developing our community of practice so that we can teach and train and bring each other on this journey of learning and, and technology change. I'm our Asia Pacific Middle East Technical Director for GIS and I'm involved in our local communities and our business development um, in New South Wales in particular, but around Australia and, and the Asia Pacific. And I also lead our Inclusion and Diversity Committee, which is very fortunate on, on my part. Um, I, have a I have eight portfolios and this is how we engage our employee networks and um, encourage people to bring their whole selves to work and recognise the intersectionality of people, not just their professional lives, what they're doing with their spare time after work, whether they identify as a, a veteran and part of the veteran network, um, different ethnic um, origins, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander are all part of our LGBTI community. But I started in geography, um, and geography is a really interesting way into a tech um, career. Um, I was into all of the different environmental sciences, biodiversity modelling, climate change modelling, um, data collection in the field. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoyed and was really good at um, was manipulating the data. And what I realised was actually not so many people were interested in that and it gave me a bit of a niche. And over the, power of, over the course of my undergrad and then um, postgrad, I, I learned to realise that you hold the pen, you hold the power, you can help people understand understand the intersection of their information with the environment and other, um, other influencing factors like socioeconomics and things. You can help them present messages in different ways. It's a really, really interesting career. Our technology has changed so many different times and it was actually the technology changes and the need to constantly build capacity amongst your, you know, your organisations as well as your community of practice that um, drove my career forward. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about where this career can take you. Um, and one place is Antarctica. Um, I've just completed a year-long Women in STEM Global Leadership course. And after um, many months of like interface and video conferencing and research and project work, we actually culminated in three and a half weeks um, in Antarctica together. Um, where I actually got to meet like science, engineering, technology leaders from all around the world um, and build a network. So one of the, one of the keys to success I'm gonna say in a technology career is look outside your own discipline and your own boundaries, build your network. Next slide. And on building that, that network, don't be, dis, don't, um, don't fail to look outside your normal boundaries of where you might find talent and recognise opportunities. Um, I mentioned one of my hats was um, as our inclusion and diversity chair. So I'm our ally champion for Jacob's um, LGBTI community, which is PRISM. Um, I work in the construction engineering part of the tech industry and we have quite a few challenges there in terms of the number of people who feel comfortable bringing their entire selves to work, being out, openly out to their managers, if they've been out at university, actually staying out and not going back in the closet. So we're really trying to create this culture and environment where people can contribute. Next slide. In doing that, we've actually been able to, I'm hoping this one will then just keep flicking through. Did you get? That should technically show the next 15, uh, oh good, excellent. Our, our community engagement, our organisational engagement and our global engagement around this portfolio. In the last two years, we've gone from zero, from a launch of this to um, actually what we're seeing today. This year we participated in 15 different um, pride parades around the world. Now, one of the really interesting things is because we have done this and we've actually been really open about our engagement, I actually now get invitations to the universities, I'm getting invitations to career events, and I'm attracting really, really good talent in this area. I have 
a small team in the Sydney office alone, I have only about 12 people. And at the moment, I have a team of 25% um, people identifying as LGBTI. We're known as the fun team, the diverse team. These people are really, really interesting and bringing a really different mix of um, ideas to the table and helping us continue to stretch our technology boundaries. So I just wanted to put that out there, that it's yet another way that we can start to engage diversity in our careers, and it might be an area you're not considering. Um, I'm a champion of gender for our organization and many of the other portfolios as well, but this one is really close to my heart. So anyway, that's what I, a couple of the takeaways I wanted to share with you today. I could talk for half an hour. It's so hard to wrap up. So as you can see from up there, I started my life out as a ballerina. Um, much to my mother's disgust, I actually ended up not doing that. But what I want to talk to about diversity and inclusion is that when I was in London, I got an opportunity to work for British Telecom. And I was only about 23, 24 at the time. Uh, and my friend who worked with me at this other company, and when they went to sign us up for employment, they all got really shocked because neither of us had a degree. So they, at the time, they were a startup organization for um, e-commerce. And out of 100 people, every single one of them had some kind of degree. Now, one of them had a zoology degree. It had nothing to do with technology at all. So that's actually been quite interesting. So when I actually worked with them, what I wanted to do was to encourage uh, young people that were on the dole and had just left school looking for opportunity. So I actually created an internship program in the middle of all these people with their wonderful degrees and all of these fancy universities that they'd been to and, got, and actually got them to agree. So we got about 10 young people around the age of 16, 17. They weren't, at the time university wasn't really a great discussion um, and three of them ended up full time and ended up with really awesome careers. And I think from a diversity and inclusion, when I went back to New Zealand, I got patted on the head a lot. And it wasn't because I was female, that was second, it was actually because I was too young. So I was too young to have had all of this experience. Um, and I was too young to be able to have, sit down and have a conversation with senior business people. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. So, um, so that's, that's the thing, I think, and from my position today, how do we encourage young people to want to come and play with us? And as I'm getting older, how do I stay young enough and vibrant enough in this new world of technology to, to be able to relate to them because they bring a wealth of uh, energy and some of the, and hiring people just for attitude. You know, you can teach people skills, but if they've got the right attitude. And then on the side of that is now getting to that point, well, am I going to be, um, if I go for another job, is ageism going to be a problem for me? And it is a problem for some people. And I ask, well, why is that? And they say to some older guys are struggling to get jobs. And they say, why can't I get work? I've got all of this experience. And I say to them, you're only as good as what your last project was. You're only, you know, that's all people are actually interested in. And if you keep harping on about the past, you sound like a dinosaur. So how do you be inclusive and how do you overcome insecurity? Because as Aileen was saying before, what about Uncle Jack? What about um, my grandmother or when I'm getting old? Who's gonna take care of my needs from a technology perspective? It's the young and it's you and it's your children, your grandchildren, and your relatives that are gonna do that. So I'm gonna finish my talk, um, and just really what I wanna sum up here is that it's collaboration, community, and tribe. And it's been able to have a, the beauty of the tapestry. How boring would it be to walk into a lolly shop and all it had was white chocolate, right? The thing about a lolly shop is the actual variety and the colours and the taste and the smell. And you can imagine having a team be really successful with all of those wonderful attributes and their weirdness all celebrated at the same time. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening.